It's a great pleasure and honor to welcome you all today to our panel on cybersecurity, disinformation, and election infrastructure integrity, lessons and priorities in advance of the German federal election. My name is Rolf Nichols. In summer two, uh, 2020, I'm vice president of the DGAP. In the past, cyber attacks, disinformation, and hybrid threats from a variety of states and actors have increasingly tried to undermine election processes in democratic countries. Even though the US has been touched by this type of interference, the last elections were considered to be safe and secure. As the federal elections approach, similar threats cannot be excluded for Germany either. So what lessons can be drawn from the US experience? Is Germany sufficiently prepared for digital interference in the election process? Which election systems such as voter roads, registration databases and tabulation software are vulnerable and how can they best be protected? How to counter adversarial strategies? Is it time for Germany to classify election infrastructure as critical infrastructure? These and other important questions we are going to discuss today with our distinguished panelists from the US and from Germany. The event is part of our preparatory cycle for the upcoming federal elections this fall. We are ha very happy to have with us today, Chris Krebs, who at the moment is founding partner at the Krebs Stamos Group and chair of the Commission on Information Disorder at the Aspen Institute. Previously, he served as the first director of the US Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, where he oversaw the agency's efforts to risk to, to manage risk to US business and government agencies. Thank you very much, Christopher Krebs, for joining us. We are also very grateful to Gerhard Schapuser for being with us today. I hope he's there now, but he, if not, he'll join us very shortly. I'm here. Uh, doctor? Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> Dr. Schapuser serves as Vice President of the Federal Office for Information Security, BSE. Dr. Schapuser is a mathematician by training and has a very long and successful experience in cryptology, information security implementation and oversight. He joined BSI already in 1991. Warm welcome to you, Dr. Scharpuser. We're also very happy to have with us today, Dr. Alina Polyakova, who is president and CEO of the Center for European Policy Analysis, a famous US think tank. Dr. Polyakova is an expert on transatlantic relations, Russian foreign policy and digital technologies. She authored the book, the dark side of European integration and numerous major reports on disinformation and democracy in Europe. She holds a PhD in sociology from the University of California at Berkeley and is fluent in German and Russian. Thank you very much, Alina Polyakova, for being with us today. Last but not least, it's my great pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, Tyson Barker. Since October last year, Tyson is head of our technology and global affairs program at DGAP. Previously, Tyson worked at Aspen Institute where he was responsible for digital and transatlantic programs and at the Bertelsmann Foundation. Originally, Tyson served in the Bureau for European and Eurasian Affairs at the US State Department. He holds a master's degree from Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. Thanks very much, Tyson, for moderating this conference today. We are looking forward to a stimulating discussion with these top-notch individuals. I bet on active participation by our members. Now I've already talked too much and too long, and I'll hand it over to Tyson. The floor is yours, Tyson. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Rolf. And uh, thanks for teeing up this discussion, which I think is going to be very interesting. Um, you know, as an American living in Germany, I'm always comparing the two systems and coming out of the 2000 election, which, as we all know, was contentious, not only on its merits of the politics, but also on the question of the integrity of the process. Um, I couldn't think of a better group to have here to discuss it. Um, one of the probably most cited post uh, election analyses came from CISA, uh, where Chris Krebs was working at the time which said that the US November election was the most secure election in US history, American history. And of course, the evidence that was provided by CISA used by journalists and independent auditors gave a lot of 
credibility to the process, which was quite important when people were questioning whether the process had been undermined due to uh, you know, cyber incidents or other things it, it re related to uh, electronic voting systems. In Germany, as we know, uh, we have paper ballots and there is a paper ballot counting process. Uh, but we have to question uh, whether or not uh, paper ballots, the, the cyber process ends at the ballot box. What are the other processes involved in maintaining and securing the integrity of elections? Um, and just thinking about the German elections in September, I think that although there are differences between the United States and Germany, big differences, there are also great similarities. You know, we're talking about two federal systems where states have and local uh, municipalities have major roles in uh, implementing election processes. And it's, it's quite a complicated uh, uh, process to manage. So I'm very happy that we have this group here today. This is on the record. Uh, we're gonna start with opening statements from our speakers. Um, and then we're gonna have a little bit of discussion between the three, the four of us. Uh, and open it up for Q&A from, from the members of DGAP. So let me start with a question uh, for uh, Dr. Uh, Schaphuser. How is the BSE safeguarding the integrity of German national elections in 2021? What has changed since 2017? And what are the lessons that could be learned from the 2020 US elections and even the 2021 Dutch elections? So let me give the floor to you. Thank you very much for having the opportunity to say something about the security of the elections in Germany. As you might know, in Germany, we will have nearly a dozen elections until the end of 2022. So the federal election in September and many state level elections, two of which took already place in on the 14th of March. Therefore, the cybersecurity of election is currently a very important topic for BSI. As you mentioned, in Germany, we typically typically have paper-based elections. So it sounds quite easy, no cyber threats available for the core process, for instance. But that's not the real truth afterwards. Of course, the, um, the process of voting is paper-based and uh, as it is counted by humans, the numbers of um, who is winning, but then the process starts of um, putting it all together. So it has to be transmitted for, from the local area to, to the stronger, uh, to the higher hierarchy, next level and so on until we come up by the federal returning officer who has to put it all together. And this is quite different in the different states. For instance, in small states like um, the Saarland, really small, um, or some um, city state, uh, which we also have, it's more or less a process of, I have a phone call to the next level. I know him personally. Authentication will be done by speaker recognition. And in parallel, we do not do have something like SMS um, processes and so on, up to processes where it's a real di digital process afterwards. And it is not a central tiered process of how it's done in the local world, so in the states and countries. This is, on the one hand side, sounds a little bit tricky, but on the other side, already in the last um, federal um, elections, BSI gave up a set of requirements which have to be fulfilled to, to get the integrity in place. We change it a little bit and strengthened it um, in the sense that we now have a more or less comprehensive um, document where the relevant aspects which have to be solved uh, are present. It's more or less based on, on ISO 2007 and the, the uh, implementation is done by a German BC Grundschutz, so baseline protection process of BSI. Uh, but nevertheless, the, uh, the integrity and um, 
and the, the result of an election is not only dependent on the core process, as we call it, but also on the aspect, are the parties sufficiently protected? Is the IT system of the party and um, protected um, correctly in the sense of cyber. So we have seen a lot of attacks in the last months that, yes, entering an IT system and encrypt it and uh, steal the data and put the data to the public to, to change the mind, to, to get money and so on. In that arena, we are active to protect uh, the, the core players in the election process, like the parties, the, the important um, candidates and so think tanks, which are relevant to do uh, mind setting and so on. Um, we did it in several states of in uh, levels of intensive intensity fee, mm, namely assisting the federal returning officer. Of course, yes, we are in this uh, present at the election day with liaison officers to support them if there is an actual crisis or so putting in the machinery of BSI to handle incidents if something happens. And we gave up a process in the sense of, yes, what do you do personally as a candidate to secure your social accounts and so on? That is not so easy to, to jump in. And of course, we did some specific activities in in um, yes, assessing mm, softwares in the pre-process of the elections, especially in the context of getting the correct candidates. There have been some, um, some virtual um, congresses of the parties in place, and there was a virtual um, and digital voting process, and we were in place there to, to secure them afterwards. Speaking about secure elections, um, I think I can conclude with a very short and short reference to the increasingly important fields of hybrid threats and helpful measures. The BSI pursue an all hazard approach. This means that no matter what kind of attack happened, we in initially respond the best way we can with all possible methods. A good protection against cybercrime, even protect against hybrid threats and other way around. It's so easy, an advanced level of cyber security in any form helps to secure the elections. Therefore, our usual task supports also the election process. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Schrapphuser. Um, I think that you've mentioned a lot of things that I think would rhyme with the US uh, process, uh, even if the core function, as you said, is paper ballots across the board. There are lots of differences across states and a lot of uh, you know, ancillary processes that also need to be uh, secured in order to guarantee election integrity. Um, Chris Crapes, you had a frontline seat. You were actually were in the driver's seat to provide a lot of that uh, certification of the integrity of US elections. Um, what were some of the lessons coming out of last year's experience? And are, what do you think would be most relevant for, for Germany and Europe? Thank you, Tyson, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Great to be here. Uh, I actually would start with our assessment of 2016. The 2016, the intelligence community in the United States released a report that um, that reviewed the Russian interference efforts in the 2016 election. And it essentially boiled down their attack to three, three different vectors. The first was attempts to compromise election inter, uh, infrastructure, election systems, election equipment. The second was targeting political parties. If you'll recall, there was a hack and leak operation where they got into the Hillary Clinton campaign and the Democratic National Committee and released uh, or sensitive confidential documents. And then the third was just this broader 
an ongoing uh, disinformation campaign to destabilize and, and sow confusion and doubt. And so we oriented around those three uh, vectors as we prepared for the 2020 election uh, with three additional takeaways uh, of where we needed to improve as the United States uh, in our election security. First was that uh, the federal government had no real meaningful way to coordinate um, uh, defensive activities with state officials. And under the US Constitution, uh, state are, are very individual states or 50 states are responsible for administering federal elections. But there was no connection between the states and the federal security apparatus, uh, it, it, at least in a meaningful way. So we had to improve that. Uh, the second was that the systems themselves uh, were not where we think they should have been. There was some legacy equipment out there, some old outdated systems. And I'm not just talking about the election machines that people vote on, but also some of the systems that help host voter registration databases, help design and print ballots, things of that nature. And then the third was even within the federal government between the security apparatus, there was not effective coordination. So we had to improve that. So fast forward to the 2020 election, we had a meaningful way to cooperate and coordinate with our federal partners. We improved security of the systems uh, that state and locals um, use to conduct elections with a key aspect there of uh, moving to paper ballots as much as possible and, and eliminating the machines where you just touch a button and then a vote is registered on removable media, a thumb drive, basically. Those are impossible to audit. Uh, if hacked, it would be very difficult to prove uh, whether the, the vote on those machines is, is legitimate. So we had to move away from those. And then the third uh, and final um, was we really had a meaningful way to cooperate and coordinate with our partners in the intelligence community in the military and law enforcement. So as we prepared for 2020, having taken those internal steps, we also conducted a great deal of scenario development, threat modeling exercises. And ultimately what it came down to was the, the risks, the scenarios that we were concerned about were not as much on the edge or at the day of voting. It was more about targeting of election uh, uh, voter registration systems. A potential ransomware attack, for instance, in the months running up to an election could be highly disruptive if you locked up the state level voter registration files. Um, similarly, on election night, you know, you, you have uh, ZDF, so you have a single or, you know, a, a much more limited media market than we do here where you have multiple media outlets that could be reporting news. And one of the things we were concerned about uh, is whether it was Russia, Iran, or China, uh, or some other actor hacking into a TV news station and changing the ticker, just changing information that would flow across the bottom. And that could be highly disruptive and would immediate, immediately having a scramble. But, but ultimately where we landed was, it was not the technical threats that we were as concerned about. It was not you know, cyber operations against election infrastructure, it was perception hacks, it was disinformation and claims that were beyond the scope or capability of an adversary, but the general voting public might not know uh, that such a thing they were claiming was impossible. That's what we were worried about. And that's what happened. <laughs> that's what happened here in the United States in the 2020 election, where we had disinformation campaigns, domestic in origin, amplified internationally, particularly by Russian outlets, uh, that alleged that a foreign power had interfered with the election. And those claims continue to this day. And we have a number of, I have a number of observations of going forward, uh, what needs to be done to improve transparency in elections, to increase trust in elections. It begins with paper, so you, you have that, which is, which is always a good thing because you can go back and check the vote. The second is you need an authoritative, incredible knowledge base of elections and how they work. The third is that you have to communicate to the public and increase transparency in the electoral process. The voters need to understand and you have to demystify the election process. And then the fourth is you have to have a quick reaction force 
What's happening is our adversaries are hitting the gaps. They're not as much uh, targeting us with technical tactical measures. They're hitting us in between with disinformation and active measures. Germany has been the, at the forefront of active measures campaigns by, num by a number of different governments for a century. And this is the sort of thing that you have uh, internal capacity that you need to focus on and you need to elevate uh, the quick reaction capability. So just some real quick uh, takeaways, Tyson, from, from 2020. Thanks so much, Chris. There's a lot uh, to work with there and I'm really uh, excited to bounce the ball also back to BSI and see how they're dealing with some of these questions because I could imagine them coming up beyond the ballot box. Uh, but first I wanna go to Alina. You are somebody who has worked at the nexus of technology and democracy on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, what are some observations, trends that you see in the kind of uh, integrity, democracy, integrity, and technology space that you think would be relevant for uh, Germany in 2021? Well, well, thanks so much, Tyson. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning to anyone who's joining from uh, the United States like I am. You know, I think Chris put out a lot of the points I was going to make, uh, so I will just... Uh, put a pin in some of the uh, some of the issues that he already brought up. Um, I think one, an issue that we see as pervasive across the democratic space, certainly in Europe and the United States, um, is a lack of a whole systems view from our own governments. And Chris already touched on this uh, quite effectively, but I think there's a few ways in which there's similarities with the United States and Germany and the lack of internal coordination that we're still seeing within the federal agencies. So we tend to have a siloed perception of hard cybersecurity threats, as Chris was saying, and we tend to parse that out from information threats, meaning disinformation and other types of information influence ops. But of course, from the adversarial perspective, and I'm here really talking about state-sponsored uh, attacks in the information environment in the cyber domain, they don't see their targets in that parsed out silent way. They have a whole systems approach and they're able to calibrate their capabilities and capacities based on the kind of vulnerabilities they're trying to target. And I think we have actually uh, spent too much time in some ways focusing elections. Don't get me wrong, elections are a critical and incredibly important event in any democratic society. But these kinds of operations, as Chris rightfully said, don't stop when we stop going to the ballot box um, in, in Germany or the United States, it's this constant drip. And we're living in a, in a society now where we are not going to be rid of information influence operations because they are primarily now domestically domestic in origin. Uh, they're not uh, primarily coming from uh, Russia or China. And frankly, we don't have a way to really see that proportion of how much is domestic, how much is foreign, because so much of it is happening on private social media platforms. But I think one thing that um, I have taken away from following what certainly the Russian operations have been in the United States and what they've done in other places um, on the front line, like Ukraine, like the Baltic states, like Georgia, and what they've been doing increasingly moving westwards um, in Europe as well, um, is that they're very good at knowing where, where our attention is and where our attention isn't. I'll, I'll bring one example from the recent US experience, which is of course we were focused so um, much on the 2020 elections as we should have been. And those were secure as Chris rightfully said, and CISA uh, gets a huge amount of credit for not just the securing the elections themselves from a hard security perspective, but from a communications perspective as well from the messaging point. But at the same time, now then we learned that we had the solar winds breach going on the entire time for months ahead of the elections. And perhaps we would, we would become more aware of that if we had been looking at the whole system versus focusing on elections. So my point is that, um, yes, elections are important, but we need to understand how we can day in, day out, coordinate internally between the federal government agencies, also working closely with private sector companies and messaging to citizens. Um, I think one place when the US we're making progress is in the coordination between the information operations, which oddly enough have been carried out primarily by the, I mean, the counter information operations space, oddly enough have been carried out by the State Department. A lot of the funding from Congress has gone to the Global Engagement Center, which is in the public diplomacy division of the US State Department. 
And when you think about protecting the homeland, it doesn't make much sense. Um, DHS uh, certainly should have had the mandate from the very beginning to counter domestic threats in the disinformation space, uh, but did not. Um, I think we have now increasing threats in the cyber domain, including on the infrastructures in the infrastructure space. I, I think we'll talk about the recent uh, colonial pipeline hack uh, here uh, as we progress. But we still, I don't see externally speaking, maybe it's happening internally, but I don't see who really owns this problem, the big problem of non-kinetic asymmetric threats and how we respond. Which, what part does the US DOD have? What part does CISA have? What part does D, you know, other parts of DHS and other parts of the State Department? And I see some of those similar uh, gaps in coordination happening in Germany as well. Um, in other European countries, the US is not unique here. I think it'd be very interesting to hear about that. Uh, and my last point is, is, is that I think on, on the transatlantic side, uh, we've tried to establish some information sharing mechanisms, but the US has not really been involved in those. So we have the European Union trying to establish this rapid response, um, uh, rapid alert system, I mean, the G7 establishes rapid response mechanism, but I don't see how those are actually effective tools. I haven't seen them in action. Um, we need much more information sharing between governments uh, to be able to get to a point where we can better assess potential threat levels so we can hopefully prevent attacks in the future. I think we need to keep in mind that's where we need to go. That it's not about 2020 election, 2021 election, one disinformation campaign and one cyber attack. This is, we are already in an environment where this is the battlefield. And we haven't quite come to terms with that. We haven't invested the kind of resources we invested in kinetic deterrence as we need to invest in non-kinetic deterrence. And that's really where we are today. But I don't think we've gone through that shift in our, in our thinking about how do we protect our democracies um, and what we really need to do in terms of investment in technologies, investment in capabilities to be able to build greater deterrence against cyber and information influence operations going forward. Thank you so much, Alina. That was an excellent uh, uh, contextualization of this question as you correctly point out that elections tend to focus the mind on uh, cyber vulnerabilities and disinformation vulnerabilities, but they are not limited to that. And in fact, can be uh, draw limited resources away from other <laughs> um, threats and possibilities. And, and you also highlighted a lot of the questions around um, the kind of state-based architecture to manage or deal with some of these threats. Uh, uh, Mr. Schaphuser, I'm gonna take up some of the, the points that Chris Krapes and Alina brought up. And I'd like to ask you to just to start, um, first, a kind of technical question. Um, in the United States, specifically in 2017 and early 2018, we heard a lot about potential tampering with voter registration rolls uh, and the security of voter registration databases. And uh, Chris Krapes brought up the, the possibility of ransomware, which was thankfully uh, avoided. Um, but what is the, the status of voter registration rolls in Germany, in the States? That's my first question. And then the second question I have for you is, this issue of perception hacks. Uh, as Alina pointed out, one of the most successful elements of CISA's response was a perception counter hack, i.e. basically uh, shoring up the credibility of the process and not letting it be undermined by disinformation campaigns, including something like uh, changing a media ticker. How is a BSI working to create perception counter hacks for the September election here. Okay, let me try to come up with a registration process for the election. That is quite easy in Germany because we have an, um, a citizen record who is citizen in Germany and every citizen who is older than 18 is available, uh, has the right to, to to vote in our election process. So we do not have a registration process for that. We don't have the need for that. The process of getting informed that um, 
that you are on the list, uh, you are um, have the right to vote, is sent by classical snail mail. And so you get, get a letter where you, it stated, yes, you are um, a potential voter and you have to go to that point to do your work and um, um, you, we, you aren't allowed to go anywhere for, for the election process. You have to go to a specific site where a paper-based list of election for, for, for getting registered. Yes, I, you, I gave up my vote afterwards. Of course, there is a cyber aspect in that, that aspect because the creation of the documents and so on will be done in the administration via electronic tools and so on. And so therefore it's very important to have a high information assurance level in the different, um, in the local government um, infrastructures afterwards. Um, Fortunately, nothing happened till now in that process, but I fear that um, so 100% uh, security will not be available. And my one of my uh, fears is that shortly before the process of creating those lists starts, a ransomware attack happens to those systems. Um, and then it could be a hard job to get it in time in place afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's, I think we have uh, not the best level of cybersecurity within our administration, depends a little bit on, on the states afterwards, but uh, Fortunately, we haven't seen ransomware attacks in, in the local governments and that especially not in the federal government. And for the federal government, it's quite easy. I know the status quite well due to the fact that ESI is responsible to do the monitoring there. Therefore, we know what happened there. For your second mm, question, mm, what do we do in doing something like perception hacks. Probably you have to give me some more minutes to think about, and probably I will come back to the question in, in the next round of uh, questions. It's better to have, I have to think about what we do in that arena. Happy to. Um, let me take up this issue of ransomware that you mentioned, that it doesn't seem like it has been a frequent occurrence with uh, state and local governments in uh, Germany yet, uh, but it of course is occurring with inc increasing frequency in the United States. Um, Chris, uh, if you were to advise the German government on you know, uh, threats on the horizon that they should watch for, um, how would ransomware fit into that and what are some other uh, issues that you would raise? Well, it, certainly from a United States perspective, I have considered ransomware as um, probably the the most underappreciated threat over the last five years, I'll say. Um, and, and the reason I say that is because it is typically and historically been viewed as a law enforcement matter, a criminal matter. It started out small. We're talking targeting single individuals. Uh, and demanding hundreds of dollars in Bitcoin, uh, but it is now transformed into a successful global criminal enterprise with uh, millions, if not tens of millions of dollars in, in uh, ransom demands. And what we saw with Colonial Pipeline here in the United States was that a ransomware event could turn into a truly uh, disrupt disruptive and potentially destructive attack that can uh, target and affect the economy. I, I am in, I'm in the Washington DC area and uh, there are still gas stations in my neighborhood that do not have gas supply. And you know, some people have run out of gas because of a criminal attack. Um, so uh, you know, the, the conditions that have led us to this place with ransomware are I think threefold. First is that we, at least in the United States with a number of our 
private sector companies as well as our state and local government uh, government agencies we've not ad- invested enough in keeping modern technologies so we have legacy outdated unsupported technologies as well as we're just not doing the basics right and sometimes the basics can be hard uh, but even things like multi-factor authentication have not uh, have not been deployed at the scale or scope that I think we we truly need. The second is the explosion of uh, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin um, that happen outside of the realm of the traditional regulatory uh, model of of the economy in finance. Uh, you know, fiat currencies are are very uh, you know generally overseen with anti-money laundering and counterterrorism regulations, cryptocurrency does not operate in that realm. So we need to do a better job of where cryptocurrency intersects with the traditional economy and the banking regulators that we enforce things like know your customer and other transparency measures. And then the last thing is that we really have to start holding some of these, uh, these criminals accountable as well as the countries that provide them safe harbor. It is no mystery that a number of these ransomware crews operate out of uh, of Russian sovereign space. And, uh, you know, for in a certain sense, it makes sense because it develops a cyber strategic force. Uh, It gives the teenagers and 20 year olds something to do that's foreign and brings back a little bit of money. uh, So there are no idle hands protesting in the streets. and it also it aligns with the strategic objectives of uh, the intelligence services, where it puts you know agencies like CISA on constant alert, always responding. The 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 um, the instant response teams here in the United States are exhausted over the last year, whether it's ransomware or some of the FSB activities. And so I would be looking across that horizon of saying, you know, what is next in Germany in terms of you know, do we have those same conditions? Are, uh, do we not have updated systems? Are we not uh, protecting our systems properly? There, you know, Brintag Chemical just last week, it was the, the US subsidiary, but still there are German, there's a German nexus there. But, you know, tilt it back over to the prior conversation, disinformation, active measures will continue to work at the seams as we focus on the technical silos, like Alina pointed out, they're gonna continue moving like water towards the low spots. And it's in between those areas where we don't have proper uh, uh, federal coordination. And Alina hit it right on the nose. The biggest gap here in the United States to counter perception hacks and to counter disinformation is that there is no senior authority that is coordinating a strategic response to disinformation. That is the number one recommendation I have to every national authority and national government is you have to have someone at a cabinet or sub cabinet level that has clear ownership from a strategic perspective to countering disinformation. Thanks for that, Chris. Um, I'm gonna ask one last question to Alina and then we're gonna open it up for questions and comments from our audience. And I know I've looked at the list, we've got some really um, impressive experts here on these topics, including some practitioners. Uh, Elena, you, you and I have both uh, participated in some NATO workshops on topics around mis- and disinformation and active measures. And you pointed out that a lot of times efforts are focused on state-backed um, operations, um, but increasingly those operations are metastasizing domestically. Um, how do you draw the line between foreign disinformation and influence operations and the point where they do start to take on a life of their own within domestic contexts? And how would you, how can we best counter them uh, in a way that respects, you know, sovereignty, democracy, uh, and you know the competences of different institutions like NATO? Well, thanks for that uh, easy question, Tyson. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, I, I, well, let me answer your question directly in just a second. I wanted to go back very quickly to what Chris ended his comments with, which is um, the need and the critical and urgent need that we now have had for years in all of our countries for someone who has a high level political mandate, a political appoint, appointee in the United States, I think that has to be at the, at the undersecretary level or above, who's the counter disinformation czar, whatever we call that, it doesn't really matter. 
Uh, but this has been a recommendation that's been out there for years. Um, and it's just a clear gap. And I hope that this administration sees that and, and moves to do something about it. Um, and that actually leads me to your direct question about how do we draw the line? There is no line. It really doesn't exist anymore. I think we, we missed the opportunity to get the low hanging fruit. What, what, what low hanging fruit is that you ask? State sponsored info ops are the low hanging fruit. Uh, because we were able in 2016 to still pinpoint the origins of these operations to a foreign country, to a foreign entity, we're able to attribute. We're, we've lost, I think, the capability to do that because they've learned how to get around our detection tools. You know, we're not going to get another uh, IRA based in St. Petersburg anymore. Yes, they're still doing things, but we lost the ability to really see um, in, 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 as to what is actually happening. Part of that is, I think, information sharing between uh, private companies, uh, social media platforms in particular, and we need to improve that kind of information sharing with intelligence agencies. And that has been happening, and the companies have been taking, I think, they deserve some credit. They've been taking some significant steps in trying to take down coordinated inauthentic behavior, as they call it, but this is still a whack-a-mole. And at this point, uh, I don't think we can draw that line. It's gone. It's been gone for a long time. So I think we find ourselves in a situation where, uh, one, we still have tools to impose punitive consequences on state actors who we can attribute operations to. Uh, I think to Chris's point about uh, proxy criminal cyber groups, you know, the relationship between the Russian government and these kinds of uh, criminal cyber hackers goes far deeper than just providing them a safe space and harbor. Uh, they, the, the Russian intelligence agencies recruit from those groups directly. Um, they allow them a safe harbor as long as they carry out only certain kinds of attacks as the Russian foreign policy and strategic interest. There is a very close relationship between cyber criminal organizations that functioning in Russia and the Russian intelligence agencies. And that relationship is at, the, at a level of people, meaning people going in and out between the two. It's at the level of strategic intent um, and it's at the level of operational tactics and sophistication. And so we also can't separate those two. Um, so we do have you know, things like sanctions that we can impose still on this very small part of the problem we're talking about because it is a small part when it comes to information operations. On the cyber side, I think it's slightly different. Uh, we do have some capabilities there to deter. Um, and I think we just haven't woken up to the reality. I don't know how, you know, since 2017, I would say that was a wake up call. It should have been a wake up call that not, the Natpetya attack in Ukraine uh, that reverberated across the world, that affected German companies, that affected American companies, that even affected some, some Russian uh, uh, banks and financial institutions because it was so sloppy. It was an attack on, on Ukraine as part of the Russian war with Ukraine, but it reverberated globally. And we, we still haven't uh, been able to grasp how we deter and impose uh, consequences for attacks like that. So I think we're still swimming out there in, in, in some ambiguous waters, unfortunately. And I think NATO's um, role here um, also has to be to what I said earlier, you know, non-kinetic threats have to be part of the mandate. I'm not saying that we need to have a discussion now, though it's, it's already happening, about Article 5 and cyber attacks, uh, but it's a discussion we need to be engaged with, we need to make some decisions about. I don't have any uh, illusions that's going to happen at the summit. I don't think we're going to see much um, at the June summit, uh, except uh, commitments made, which is important, but uh, we really need to move forward um, in thinking about how do we invest in non-kinetic ca capacities, capability, and deterrence. And if we look at the U.S. budget, if we look at any defense budget right now, that you know, sometimes you can just look at the numbers and you know where our priorities are. Our priorities aren't there. Uh, thanks, Alina. I think somebody said once, uh, "You show me your budget, and I'll show you my your values." Uh, exactly. I think definitely makes sense here. Um, we are going to open it up for questions and comments from the audience, but I did want to give uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Schaub, who's a, a, uh, the opportunity to come in and uh, come back to that question about perception hacks. And essentially, the question is, 
how is the BSI working to give German voters the confidence in the integrity of their elections? Um, okay, so, so formally we have um, for, for the, uh, the aspect of perception hacks and other information campaign established in the German government, um, a workforce called hybrid. Um, where all the ministries are involved in the sense of coordinating the activities, like Alina said, that is, this is one of the most important things to do. And having in said what about perception attacks and how to convince the citizen that um, it's sufficient secure, I think we have a different tasks in the German government. For the one hand side, the federal prof press office is responsible for the communication in the direction of the citizens. And if it comes to counter disinformation things, the foreign office has also a role and they are closely connected to do that. Um, what is the role of BSI? Typically, we will give a short um, assessment of, uh, from a technical point of view, what happened there, and then an assessment in the sense of, is it a real attack or is it something usual thing with which happened there? And it's our task, we are in the uh, work, workforce um, hybrid integrated, that we transform our, uh, give our information on a short basis, so nearly in real time to the federal press office, which that then typically goes to, to do it to the communication to the citizens afterwards. I think this is the process we work on. So no direct work of BSI, but doing the technical expert, giving the technical expertise to the um, professionals for communication afterwards. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question or a comment from Lutz Gunnar. Uh, Lutz, you're up. Introduce yourself and ask or, or state what you want to state. Thank you, Tyson, and uh, great to see you, uh, Alina, and many others. Um, and thank you very much for these uh, very, very uh, impressive and, and important comments. Um, I'm working for the European Union for the Diplomatic Service, the External Action Service. You know that we have invested a lot in the in this field of, uh, let's say, addressing disinformation, foreign interference and have actually developed kind of a real policy framework for this, which is called the European Democracy Action Plan. And I'm not talking too much about this, but you know that there are very different elements that we would like to bring together in terms of rules for political parties, in terms of media, uh, um, let's say also here, uh, support on the one side, but also stricter rules. And then of course, on let's say the interference in the information space, uh, specifically on disinformation, uh, more stringent rules and even legislation for the for the platforms, but then a specific focus on the on the foreign uh, actor side, and that would be uh, kind of a question to both Chris and and Alina. Um, I mean, we are I think all in our professional work are still struggling with this internal external nexus. You know, what do we do? How do we distinguish these two? And um, I think we we still don't have a good good approach. I mean, in our work, um, we focus on those cases where we know pretty well where we can link it to the state actors, where we can have the the state sponsored outlets. But of course, this goes all very quickly into some gray zone and in between. Kind of, is it now external or internal? And my question to both of you is: one of the tendencies that we are seeing, that many others in the platforms are seeing, is an increasing commercialization. You know of the of this sector so more and more pr companies sorry i missed the very first kind of minutes of this discussion i hope you didn't mention it already but more and more pr companies are actually doing the job for the state actors with black pr what can we do about this you know because this is opening yet another chapter that makes it more difficult for us um, because then we would need to trace kind of the financial flows who's paying them etc 
And I'm, I'm just wondering whether you have good ideas around this and maybe um, an add on to Chris, because especially in your new incarnation, also on the commercial side, um, and we are still using kind of terminology that is going a bit in, in all directions, disinformation, interference, influence. I've seen in the report from the joint um, uh, services, um, you know, that they distinguish interference from influence now, kind of, uh, which is more the cyber on the one hand, the influence on the other. Uh, we are working hard in the EU to put a bit of order in this, but also this is, is very, very difficult. Do you have a, <laughs> do you have the magic wand that we can use, Chris? <laughs> no. Um, I, you, look, you, you raise a lot of really interesting points and highlight the sophistication of the market right now. Um, one of the, you know, the, all that said, you know, what I tend to say is that, um, you know, disinformation is the world's third oldest profession. We all know what the first one is. The second is intelligence operations, intelligence collection. The third is disinformation. And, and so as we were thinking about the election space, we, it, you know, and how disinformation in general intersects with the American public, we, we had to think through, okay, who are the players involved? What are the equities? What are the objectives? And so we actually broke it down into a almost a supply and demand approach, where from a supply side, it's always going to be coming in. And so we'll use the intelligence upper, uh, community, the military, uh, uh, the Department of Defense, uh, and the platforms. And so they can go disrupt operations, whether it's Project Lockta or IRA coming out of St. Petersburg, or whether they've migrated to Ghana or uh, Ukraine or even Mexico, you still you can identify inauthentic, inauthentic coordinated behavior, share it with the platforms, and they can go disrupt. But to the point, that is whack-a-mole because they will always improve. When you put friction into their operations, they'll ditch that style and they'll adjust and they continue like water flowing into the low points and the gaps. So we focused at CISA at least on demand. And it's not eradicating demand because you can't do that, but it's informing and in trying to organically uh, put people in a position where maybe they don't, they're not as receptive or they can reject it. And it's about inoculation. And that was really what was behind the concept of our war on pineapple awareness campaign from, from a couple of years ago, where we took the evolution, the anatomy and pathology of a disinformation campaign in a non-obtrusive way uh, that that people could engage with. So it's whether you know it's a strangely it actually started in Canada, but it's a strangely American thing. Whether you like pineapple on your pizza, I think it's disgusting. Personally, I don't I don't put fruit on pizza, but nonetheless, it is it is a very binary option. You either like it or you don't. But nonetheless, it's it's about education. It's about building awareness. It's about transparency as well. And that again, when we bring it back to elections. You, it, it's if it's a black box, it creates opportunity space for an adversary to insert confusion and doubt. So to the extent that you can get there before the bad guy, expose through a transparent way the mechanics of how things work, that helps suppress demand. It, it says, oh, you know what? So when the disinformation comes over and it hits the target, the target's not receptive to it because they understand that's not how things work. So that's for us, I think we have to put a lot more investment into civics education, digital literacy, uh, in, in education. And, and unfortunately, though, and this is the caveat, is that there is certainly in the United States, there is a significant population of people um, that voted for the former president. I'm talking tens of millions of people that it doesn't matter what anyone says they're gonna say you're part of the deep state or you're lying. And as long as the former president continues saying that the election was stolen, they are gonna believe the election was stolen. They are gone, you will never recover them. So what we have to focus on now is who are the people that are sitting on the fence, who are, or who are wavering, who might fall into that population? How do we keep them from falling into that population? How do we keep others from flowing into, as I call it, the fever swamp? That's the area that we need to focus on. Don't waste time over here. Focus on here. Thanks, Chris. Elena, that was at you too. And then I'm going to give the floor back to uh, Gerhardt and then we'll, we'll wrap up. 
No, I, I, I'm glad that uh, Chris brought up the, the pineapple, uh, pizza pineapple campaign. I thought that was brilliant. It's what we should have been doing all along. Um, it's very clear that appealing to people's you know, basic emotions, like humor, um, is very key. And I think we've been very cautious. You know, governments, especially the U.S. government, the State, the State Department, uh, are very cautious in how they use humor because it could be misinterpreted in different contexts. I remember having this conversation in 2015 in Washington before, uh, obviously, the Russian interference in the 2016 elections came to light, uh, where uh, you know there wasn't much of an understanding of how uh, to use these kinds of tools. Nobody cared too much about it at the time. And so I think we thought that disinformation, and Lutz, I agree with you, we're still in that back and forth and definitions. Um, we could have another, another session about that. Uh, <laughs> but it seems like we most people understand disinformation to basically mean the same thing, which is the intentional spread of misleading uh, information. Um, but that is to say that you know, early on, we thought in the, in the US and I think in, in Germany and other Western uh, European countries that this was something that happened far away. This was something that happened in places like Ukraine and places like Estonia and, and elsewhere that we didn't have to worry about so much because we were so resilient that of course we would not uh, be targets and victims. Of course now, uh, you know, six years later, I think we've all learned otherwise. Um, I do think there's uh, a difference between where Germany and the United States is when it comes to some of the long-term resilience uh, questions that, that Chris brought up. Um, I think Germany is in a much better position um, in terms of civic education, digital skills, uh, literacy, for one particular reason, which is the public education system, which in the United States, we have a very fractured, very localized um, educational system up to the post-secondary level. Uh, the idea of having a federal curriculum is a non-starter, I think. Um, because we have so many private schools, charter schools, et cetera. But I think Germany is in a very good place. And I'll just say one very quick thing. I was actually in Germany right before the pandemic. Um, and I met with teachers in Nordrhein-Westfalen. Um, and they came to me. And it was a really kind of strange discussion. It was about four or five teachers uh, from, a, I think, a gymnasium and a few other in, the, in another school in Nordrhein-Westfalen. And they basically said to me, look, we're being asked to develop digital media literacy curricula, but no one taught us what that is. And so we have, you know, the state asking us to teach our students, but we don't know. And I'm a math teacher, you know, I'm a, I'm a science teacher and a student comes to me and says, how do I know something is a fact? And I don't know how to answer that question. So I think we're talking about, um, you know, uh, an approach that has to take into account the messengers, right? And the teachers are still quite trusted. They can cross many societies, certainly in Germany, but they also need the kinds of tools to be able to do what we're asking them to do. Thanks, Selena. Um, final word to uh, Dr. Uh, Schapuse. Thanks, Alina, for saying that our uh, education system and school system is quite good, but you mentioned really an important point. And I think Digitization and education is in Germany not that mature as it should be, because um, as Chris said, it's very important to get the citizen aware of techniques of this, how this information and digitization can work. What is the um, um, methods how I can check whether something is a fact or not a fact to, to get it second assessment to that things and so on and and as you mentioned the, the teachers yes indeed i think the um the digitization maturity of our teachers aren't aren't sufficient um, to go in that direction ahead and i think this is a challenge which we have um Fortunately, this is one one positive aspect of the of our COVID nineteen pandemic. This, this aspect forced us to digitize a lot of in the uh, also in the um, education arena. That doesn't work really good, but it is what was more or less a wake up call. Hey, we have to do something there, and this, I hope this will help us in the um, in getting a more 
higher maturity level in the context of, yes, uh, digitization and assessment of threats and opportunities for our citizens afterwards. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Schaphuser. You bring up a point uh, that I think that the Germans are very interested in, which is digital IDs uh, and their use with public administration, which of course is going to bring lots of new opportunities, but also new threat vectors as well. So this conversation will definitely continue. Um, thank you to all three of our speakers, Chris Krebs, uh, Alina Poyukova, and uh, Gerhard uh, Schaphuser. Um, I really appreciate this discussion. I personally am a fan of pineapple pizza, but uh, clearly this is a topic that we will uh, stick with that and cybersecurity with the elections. Uh, stay tuned for more of our work on uh, the German elections and foreign policy. Thanks everyone. <laughs>